So, all right. I am going to introduce the one and only Glenn DeVries, um, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of Medidata, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about later, but it is arguably, not even arguably, it is one of the most successful healthcare companies ever, um, and certainly in New York City, led the way, paved the way for what is today like the biggest digital health ecosystem. Um, and believe it or not, it's 20 years old. So Glenn was- Almost well, 22. All right, 22. All right, you know, I'm shaving years off your, you know. I'll take, I'll take. Off you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's Glenn's day job. Um, just some background, he did his undergrad at Carnegie Mellon in uh, molecular biology. Uh, he was a research scientist at the one and only Columbia University. He did computer science at NYU. So all of that's to say, you're a nerd. <laughs> I'm, a nerd. I'm about as nerdy as you can get. That is 100% correct. 100%. Um, but anyhow, welcome, Glenn. I'm so excited. I'm uh, really looking forward to this for, for a couple of months. So yeah. The Patient Equation uh, is your new book out on Amazon. Um, and we should tell people that, well, I guess we'll, you can just Google it, at, or we can put it in the, the chat and we'll send out links. But I think one of the nicest things I saw is that you're donating all the proceeds to um, conquer cancer. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not a, it wasn't a mission to, you know, uh, be drinking margaritas in Aruba <laughs> on the rights to patient equation, the movie, right? I, it was <laughs> a collection of things that I really want to get out there. So uh, yeah, um, the, the ASCO Foundation is a really good research focused organization. They actually do stuff globally, even though it's, ostensibly has the word America in the name, but um, it's a great organization. So yes, all will okay. ask over. Well, let's, la you know, let's launch right into the patient equation. So what made you write a book? Um, so uh, apropos to what you were saying before, I've been, I've been in our world for a long time. Um, I've met a lot of really, really interesting people. I've been inspired a lot. Um, I've had the opportunity to be part of inventing some things. And, and um, I just, um, I, I felt like I had a, a lot of things that, whether it was in a conversation like we would have like at a NYCHBL event or um, at a academic conference or even with like a client, there were just lots of ideas that um, really felt like they strung together. And I just wanted to, again, they're not all mine, put stuff down between all those conversations that maybe has useful ideas roadmap for the future of how we think about research, how we think about healthcare. Um, I, uh, I don't know, I just felt compelled to, to put it on paper. I'm really glad I did, um, but I, I wish I could tell you that it was like I woke up one morning, I was like, oh, I have to write a book. It just, mm -hmm. it kind of happened slowly over time, and, and then I actually started. So what, but it, the name of the book is Patient, and I have read it, um, and I just want to share with the audience, it's, in, it's really, really well done. It's so embraceable, like you really... We'll, we'll go through more of the content, but you really feel like you're there with Glenn um, as uh, he's describing data and, and sharing and non-sharing and all of that. So I, I'd highly encourage you to, uh, to get a copy after this. Thanks, Why the patient? What's what's that about? What's the patient equation? So, so um, actually, there, there's, a, there's a, a thing that happened to me, which was at Columbia, actually, at the, the hospital, which is not in the book. Um, and it's kind of related to the first anecdote that the book starts with. So mild spoilers. Um, but back when, back when I was um, actually doing research myself, um, I would run around the hospital. I'd look for interesting patients. I tried to get them into the, this research study I was working on. And I remember meeting this guy. Um, I was doing prostate cancer research. So guys on the phone who are over 40 probably know, you know what their PSA score is or know that they get that done. And... This, um, this engineer had a card in his wallet that had dates and PSA scores on it. He would literally kept a table of all of his prostate specific antigen scores um, as he was getting treated for prostate cancer. I think it was the first time I ever saw a patient tracking their own data. Um, I had a ton of experiences at Columbia Presbyterian um, that kind of moved me from being science centric, which as a real nerd, I was like, I was really just interested in science. And then through ha a lot of ha happy circumstance, um, I got very connected to this 
important concept, which is that we're treating people, we're treating people we know, but if we don't know them, they're people too. Like I, I got very focused on the, the human aspect of the science. And the book um, opens with uh, a story of this guy, Jack Whalen, who is an amazing patient advocate who's uh, sadly passed away. But he took what this guy who I'd met 25 years prior was doing and was doing it in spreadsheets in a really um, uh, intricate, robust way. And I think it was the most sophisticated at the time. This is uh, almost a decade ago. Um, I'd seen a patient um, can proactively track their own metrics. And he was tracking his cancer markers, not within the context of one therapeutic cycle, like a physician might be doing, but as he went from clinical trial to clinical trial, from doctor to doctor, from on-market to off-market medication, on-label, off-label use. And, and I honestly think Jack kept himself alive, like maybe for the better part of a decade, when otherwise he would have it passed away because he was so proactive about, tr about tracking himself. He actually came to MediData a couple times and we would have him speak to engineers so they could understand how impactful the way we were thinking about data could be on somebody's life and, and how somebody who really understood the almost engineering and mathematical aspect of their biology um, could, could actually leverage systems and data. So the patient equation, like the, the title um, has both literal and metaphorical elements. So you take kind of what Jack was doing and he was looking at, at certain um, variables, tracking his progress over time. And the way I kind of started to think about things like this over the years is there, those are really inputs. And again, it goes back to my Columbia days. Like you have certain things that you track and if they go up, it's unhealthy or sometimes if they go down, it's unhealthy, vice versa. And then you have outputs. What treatment should I get? Should I go into a clinical trial? Should I not worry about this particular condition? And the patient equation is about the concept and then in some cases, the actual implementation of more sophisticated ways to think about with certain inputs, we can do a better job of the outputs, how to treat certain patients. Um, and just thinking that way, breaking some of the, what I think were yes, no, you know, um, heads, tails, <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. decisions that were made in medicine to more sophisticated math. I think that's going to be one of the keys to kind of unlocking longer life, better life, higher patient value. And so really the book is kind of my, uh, as I said before, um, attempt to try to show people that there might be really interesting paths there and how we could all kind of walk down them together. Well, you know, it's safe to say that over your career and at many data, you've pioneered the use of technology, right, to capture data from human beings, whether iPhone or, and I'm sure there was stuff before that. Um, but in the book, you make the point that we capture all of this data all over the place. We do. We have a lot of data, but there's no really seamless way to integrate it yet, even yeah in 2020, right? So what, see, I really did read it. Yeah, you did. No, I, I, I know from <laughs> that work. Like anybody online, Bunny actually read the book. <laughs> I read it. <laughs> so, all right, so where do we go from here? I mean, yeah. you know, we have a sophisticated audience. They know about tech and data. We have it. So where do we go from here in terms of getting to that individual or patient patient equation. Yeah, so so I think, yeah, I obviously agree, we have it. And, and I hate to make it super simple, but the answer is we got to use it. And I think we've got to act with some incrementalism. Um, one of the things that I tried, uh, at least I hope I, I did in the book, was make things sound um, bite-sized. I do think that there's some grand ideas, but it doesn't mean that we can't take steps along the way. And I, I feel like a lot of people will hang their hat on some kind of science fiction style future um, and we need to amass all this data and get it in one fancy data model and have this predictive algorithm that looks at everything about us. Um, and, and we don't. Um, I think we can, it, science fiction in the future is built on incremental steps. Uh, I, I was actually just talking about this with some uh, people this morning. Like I, I've heard this phrase, I, I actually don't know who said it first, but like data is the new oil. And, oh yeah. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, um, can I use the word shitty at an NYCHBL? Yes, please. Okay. We love, I think we that, love I think, that. I think that's a super shitty analogy, right? So, um, and, and I'm sure it was said with good intent, but you know, oil is something that like takes eons to, to 
get ready in the ground and it's really hard to find and there's a limited amount of it on planet earth. None of those three things, which I think are the three most fundamental things that apply to oil, apply to data. That's why I say it's a shitty analogy. Um, it, there's, data is everywhere. It is instant to get. To your point, like I'm sure, especially with this audience, we probably are, are all wearing some kind of medical device or at least have a smartphone, right? Which is a medical device anyway. It can you know, right. keep track of our steps. Even if you're not using it for that, it's got you know, a pedometer in it and it knows where you are. So. The data is everywhere. Now we just have to start to figure out how to, with all this abundancy of the stuff, unlike oil, we have to do one of the things that actually is a good analogy with oil, which is that we have to refine it and make it into something useful. And that's where I think the incrementalism starts to come into play. Um, can we start to, as people who are, are I know, like Bunny and I are both into like fitness, like use data to make ourselves um, healthier and better athletes. Can we use data that we might've been neglecting to uh, make a better decision in a healthcare context. And, and I don't think that we're, I really don't think that we're gonna diagnose somebody's cancer based on their Apple Watch data. But I'm also like in my hypothesis heart of hearts, I, I think that there's probably a lot we can learn by adding people's Apple Watch data to the more traditional data that's sitting in their medical charts. And that's really what I, I want to have people thinking about with the patient equation. It's almost like when you learn how to, how to do things in algebra and you keep adding terms to the equation. Like we use some of the obvious terms now, but there are terms that might be less obvious. And how do we discover what they are? How do we add them to the, the equations we make? And um, if I can, I'll give you like a, a, a really interesting like COVID example of that. Which, Please. Uh, you know, me too. And anytime I talk about COVID, I have to tell, I have to say, I was wrong about so many things related to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, I think I'm in reasonably good company about that. But <laughs> like I was right, right about stuff. But one of the things that so many of us are wrong about is what are the key terms of the equation of who is going to have a bad COVID-19 case based on ex exposure to SARS-CoV-2? And nine months ago, I would have said age and immune status. And by the way, those terms are in there and they're correct, but there are other terms that are also really important and we don't know which they are. And maybe if I was watching somebody's activity data, could I see that they were sliding into a period of inactivity that might coincide with the beginning of, of what looked like a fever? Or maybe if I looked at people's um, sleep data, I could, just, I could see early whether or not they were going to stop responding to a particular um, cancer therapy. Like this idea of being additive, I think is good for innovation. And I think it's good in terms of how we think about helping doctors and patients make the best decisions. And again, all that's really what I'm trying to connote with the book in the title and the way I talk about it. So, you know, you brought up COVID-19, obviously it's, you know, the elephant in the room, so to speak. Um, and you even wrote a whole extra chapter in the book um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, I mean, there are many other parts of the book that um, are really interesting. Obviously, COVID-19 is incredibly relevant. Um, and in the book, you make the point that not much has changed from 1918. Right. Um, right, when it comes to the ability to understand and prevent this. Um, so COVID exposed fragility in our system in so many ways. Yeah. What could we have seen it? Like what? So I, 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 hindsight is always so skewed, right? So it's, it, it, it's very easy to look back and say, this is everything we got wrong. And this is everything we could have seen. Um, but I do think that there's some glaringly obvious bad assumptions that we made in society and all of a sudden we're, we're realizing them. Um, actually, truth be told, the book was supposed to come out in March and um, not the, the publisher, um, but the printer that Wiley had shut down and then literally like went out of business, unfortunately. Oh. And what that meant was um, there was an opportunity to actually revise the book because it had to be printed again. So it's almost like a second edition, even though this is the first time it's actually been available. So added after about COVID and, and it actually, um, put kind of a, an underlying exclamation point behind some of the ideas in the book. And I, I think in some ways we, I hope we benefit from that as a society, like we can't all be in the same room at the same time, right? So, um, I don't know, a year ago, I'm sure, you know, if we were talking about this, we said, oh, great, we'll get everybody together and somewhere in somebody's 
campus in the city and we'll all hang out and have our NYC HBL event. No, we're doing it over Zoom. Right. That's a kind of trivial one, but this idea that we could put a physician and a patient in the same room at the same time turned out to be a terrible assumption, right? And right. all the work that people have been doing, I saw you have a, a session coming up about it with virtual um, interactions, with telemedicine, with clinical trials in my world where you send patients home with sensors. These things are gonna be super important. And not only gonna be super important because we need them to practice medicine and to stay healthy in environments where we can't put people in the same room at the same time. I actually think there was an article that just came out in, um, uh, in Nature Medicine, I would, what, maybe it was yesterday, say Tuesday, yeah, it must've been yesterday, um, about access. And it was actually, forget COVID for a second, it was about how far most people on the planet are from being able to go to a doctor. And, right, and what their driving distance is and what their walking distance is. And you just realize like what, what a disparity there is in different parts of the world from a geo, socio, political, economic lens, which is terrible. Like this is a problem that we ethically and frankly, societally, economically really need to solve. Well, maybe some of the things that we had as bad assumptions and like, Manhattan about how easy it is to get to an academic medical center where everybody knows about the latest cancer research. Like maybe the idea that we don't have all of those assumptions anymore will actually help us practice better medicine, not just kind of like in a city, but everywhere in the world. Um, so I, I think that, that I'm not going to say that there's silver linings to COVID-19. That would be terrible to say, um, but maybe we'll learn some stuff as a society and just to really be dire for a second, um, we better learn some things because I'm actually kind of worried about something. And there was even an article I saw somewhere about dentists starting to realize this. Nobody's been going to the doctor. So we have a planet that has skipped almost a year of checkups. How many people had diseases that were undiagnosed? Right. right? We've had almost a year and we probably will be a year of people not getting their chronic diseases actively managed. Like, what does that mean for how they're progressing? We've had, and I mean, I'm sure it, there are probably people on the call and everybody knows people, people who like life-threatening diseases who didn't, didn't get to go to the doctor. They didn't get their therapies because they couldn't, not because they didn't want to, because they shouldn't have shown up at a medical center where everybody was like spewing virus everywhere and they were immunocompromised. So we're going to come out of this sicker like planet earth is going to be full of sicker people than there than we were when we started this thing it's not like covid's over we're back to where we were we're like minus 10 squares and so we're going to have to learn these lessons we're going to have to figure out how to think and act differently um because everybody's going to have tons of extra tooth decay everybody's going to have undiagnosed diabetes and cancer right not everybody literally but you know i just i think that, that this stuff is going to become really important we're going to realize that we have to be much better at healthcare than we were well, you know, it's sort of to build on that, the, um, you know, the COVID laid bare, right? The immense inequities in our healthcare system. So even the people in the past who could go, right? And drive the two hours to, uh, you know, see a doctor for 10 minutes. Um, there, there are so many who didn't have care before COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, so but, where, uh, well, yeah. How does the patient equation address the, the inequities, right? Yeah. Like how, yeah. So yeah, look, I'm, I'm a nerd scientist. I'm in my swim. I know life. you're a nerd. So it's not like the patient equation is going to solve all inequity in society, you know, <laughs> as much as I hope it brings people together intellectually. Um, but I do think there's things to think about. Like, look, in New York City, right, in our backyard, in our house, right, I, the I, map is behind you. Um, I'm a born and raised New Yorker. Like I know we all love, so many of us in the call love New York. Like if you, were in a, if you were in a poor neighborhood where the ratio of nursing staff to patients was lower, you had a worse chance of getting out of the hospital if you went in and got on a ventilator because you weren't getting turned as much. Like maybe it'll come out to be something else, but that at least the last time I was, I was looking at it, that seems to be what the data shows. So we have inequities which we need to address. How do we address that? Again, I think some of that is probably not above my pay grade, but stuff that we need lots of people to contribute to, but understanding what the factors that create the 
inequities in outcomes is an important way to go and figure out how we get the nursing staff to be trained properly and or to have more of them per patient in, in areas that need them. Or maybe we need to move the nurses you know, somewhere else. Are there differential outcomes that come because of different ethnic backgrounds or, or different um, socioeconomic situations or even habits, right? The answer might be yes. And we need to be able to find those factors in the equations. We need to see what inputs really matter. So as a, as a society, we can focus on fixing them so we get equitable outputs. And, and I honestly think that this is something where, um, probably in a good way, the, the ethical um, obligations that we all have in healthcare actually line up very nicely with the commercial outcomes that everybody wants. If you are a pharmaceutical company, and at, at, at my company, at Medidata, we, we um, for a long time have been doing stuff around diversity in clinical trials. If you do a clinical trial and it is all on affluent white people and it looks like your drug works and then you put it out in the world and it doesn't have the same effects that you thought, like shame on uh -huh. you. Right, because you didn't take a representative sample in a representative care environment to see what was going to happen. So again, you have a commercial reason to make sure that you are testing your drug on a huge variety of people from different backgrounds, different everything. And it's also the right thing to do, right? So it's always nice when like the ethics and the commercial line up. Absolutely uh, line up. Yeah. Well, since Medidata does do so much uh, clinical trial work, yes. uh, we're in the midst of a lot of Vaccine trials. Yes. I'm known as the vaccine queen now because I talk about vaccines a lot. Um, any observations? I'm not asking for like, you know, data or anything, but any observations on the on the vaccine trials? I bet you're... Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I literally don't know anything that everybody else, you know, doesn't know. I, I see the data at the same time anybody else sees it in the Lancet or um, the journal or whatever. But um, the fact of the matter is I, I feel really optimistic I mean, it looks like there are very different vaccine strategies that are being followed. They seem to all be resulting in efficacy, at least in the context of, do these patients look like they have the same kind of immune response that a convalescent COVID-19 patient would have? And it looks like that's happening in the vast majority of cases. And are there adverse um, events that are being recorded? Yes, and that happens in all clinical trials, unfortunately. unfortunately. Are there adverse effects as related to the vaccines? At least so far in the data we've seen, it doesn't look like that's gonna be a huge problem or if a problem at all. So like, we're gonna have vaccines. I actually think apropos to access, it's gonna be really good when a couple of these get over the line because we are gonna face the largest manufacturing, manufacturing logistics problem. But it, somebody said to me the other day, uh, you know, vaccines don't, take care of pandemics. Um, vaccinations do. Vaccinations do, right? So we're going to have to figure out how to get that done. And um, it's no secret, like Moderna is my client. And I think the idea of an mRNA based vaccine is genius and awesome. And like, would have been science fiction when I was a university student at Carnegie Mellon. It's like super cool. It's, you know, not to make a play on words, but if you have to keep your vaccine, you know, that cold to get it where it's been manufactured to the patient, that's going to be a problem. So it's like, a problem, yeah. Yeah, having that to start and then maybe having stuff that is actually room temperature stable and we can manufacture different scales and get out to different parts of the world and really think strategically about doing it. That to me is the, the next big challenge. Are vaccines going to be available at work? Yes. And by the way, do we have to convince people, probably not on this call, but do we have to convince people that like medical research is done by people who give a shit about medicine? Sorry, now I've used shit twice. I'm sorry, you're welcome. Right. You should <laughs> Somebody <twice>. liked it. <laughs> But we like I, I think there's also with the unfortunate climate that the world is in, there's a huge amount of bad information about what safety means and you know what what is the line between um, evidence and trust when I think most of us in life sciences and healthcare think about evidence, not just oh Glenn's a great guy, so let's you know trust what he says. No, like we present these packages. So we have we have we have education fights we have to fight. We're going to have manufacturing and logistics issues that we're going to have to overcome, and I, uh, I'm in no way trivializing them. But are we going to have something at the beginning of that process that works? Yeah, I think we are. So that so that gives me some level of of hope for us societally getting past this soon. 
Well, given some of the, you know, probably for the first time, the pharmaceutical industry is seen in a much better light than our regulatory. Yeah. Right. Um, which is never I've seen in my life. Um, so let's, we'll get past this regulatory issue, but do you think it will have an impact going down the line on people like in the book, you talk, you know, you talk about people with rare disease, with chronic disease, with all types of diseases. Yep. Do you think that what's going on today will have an impact on how they um, view treatments? That's an interesting question. So I don't know if it'll have an impact, impact, impact on how they view treatments, uh, actually. Or take them. I, I do have an opinion on that. I think you know, there's no way that any of us are gonna live through this. Those of us lucky enough to do that and not have a different opinion about things, like this is the kind of, of event mm -hmm. changes your opinions for life. But I definitely think it'll change the way treatments are delivered. And e even just in the context we were talking about it, right? So if you have a chronic disease um, and you have a drug now that is dependent on or, or works better through active management with a doctor where there's some kind of read back of what your, your HbA1c or your blood sugar is and you adjust dosing based on that, right? The, the you know, artificial pancreas that's automatically adjusting your insulin dose like changes the lives of diabetics. What other chronic diseases where the assumption was that you could go get your blood tested and your doctor could adjust your prescription are gonna come with some kind of sensor and or app that helps you manage that disease from home. Um, how many treatments that you would have had to go to a clinic for because you were getting some kind of enzyme replacement therapy or some kind of infused cancer um, therapy where it's gonna come with a medical device and that's gonna be part of the deal, that's gonna be part of the medicine, you know, you're gonna get it at home. You know, a lot of rare diseases are some of the therapies out there are you know enzyme replacement therapies, and so the idea that we can we can think more at scale about making drugs that work in people's houses um, is probably going to change for the better the quality of life and the access to care for people with a lot of rare diseases. I also think that we're going to start connecting data a lot more, um, and I apologize for you know, talking about medi data explicitly. Um, but like one of the things that we're doing is we're working with companies like Datavant um, and some healthcare providers to bring lots of data together that wouldn't have been brought together before and linking it in ways that it wouldn't have been linked before. That kind of activity is going to lead to us building better disease progression models, better diagnostic models. Not just we're doing it for COVID, but it's going to the systems, the techniques, um, the integrations are going to, I think, have a lot of downstream positive effects. I think it'll change the way we think about value and safety and efficacy uh, for the long haul, again, in a good way. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions, which I want to take now. And actually, we did this last on our last call. So I'm going to let Gautier um, ask his question live. Gautier, I just gave you the ability to talk. I, ho I hope you're on. Yeah, I am. Hi. Thanks. So, by the way, Go Gautier is my former student. At oh, nice. Hi. Hi, both. Uh, thank you so much, Glenn. That's so interesting. Um, so I haven't read the book yet. So it's maybe something that you addressing in the book. But uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, equations can link a number, a large number of different variables. Mm -hmm. And is there one you think is more important than others? Uh, and that's really something we should like optimize to. Mm, so um, at the risk of sounding like I'm avoiding answering your question, I am going to, if it's okay, kind of change it around a little bit because um, I, 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 do, I will say that if you think about the inputs, we do need to expand the way we think about that to be as inclusive as possible. I actually have kind of like a diagram in the book that goes from like, DNA to messenger RNA to protein to cells to organs to the full body, which is also sometimes where we stop until COVID-19. And now everybody realizes, even if they don't use the words, that contract tracing is related to your phenotype, um, as is your location and what the amount of SARS-CoV-2 uh, that you're exposed to. Um, like all this, like the full stack of your environment down to the, the, the first germline copy of your DNA, all that needs to be thought of as the inputs. And I actually don't have an opinion as to like one that's more important than the others. But I do think, and, and I talk about a little about it a little in the book, we need to think about the outputs differently. We have very traditional medical 
views on what good looks like in terms of evaluating new therapies. And um, you, know, you don't have to take my word for it, go talk to some patient advocacy organizations. What's valuable to a patient may look very different than um, what sounds good in a New England Journal of Medicine article. And it's not because the people writing that article have bad intent, it's just that we were measuring things that might've been impersonal or not impactful to quality of life. And so um, you have a thing in the book, like you know, is the fountain of youth living forever? Or is the fountain of youth taking the, the graph of the duration of your life with the quality of life being the y-axis and keeping the data points as high as possible? That actually increases the area under the curve a lot more than low quality of life with a long tail. And so I think we need to think about those quality of life measures and probably hold ourselves to, um, I won't say higher, different standards in terms of how we think about that. So I think the outputs um, are the things that we really need to think differently about. Thanks, Gautier. Um, we have another question from Bertrand, who I just, um, you can, okay, Bertrand. Yeah, hi guys. Hey, Bertrand. And actually what I forgot is uh, to say who you are, what you do, so like we have some context for the question. Okay, so, uh, the, uh, so yeah, I'm Bertrand. Um, I'm the founder of Genetic Intelligence. I met uh, a buddy recently. And Glenn, I think we actually met like three years ago. Uh, we had an interesting discussion. I think you're on the Columbia Healthcare. Uh, you probably don't remember, okay? But I think you did one of those uh, Columbia Healthcare conference in, sometime in February. It was either 2018 or 2017. Okay. Um, but yeah, very inspiring story, right? But yeah, so I have a question. Um, what, you dis what you were discussing regarding data, right? Mm -hmm. And we all have these healthcare devices now. Yes, true. Yep. And they could be used in various you know, ways to actually be helpful to us. But something that actually concerns me is how you know, other types of data that relates to us are used today, right? When you consider Twitter, Facebook, Google, they provide valuable, extremely valuable services that we can't do anything about. I mean, we, without that, we, you know, our lives would be much worse, right? At least from my perspective. But we have to ask for their permission every time to, to use those services, right? We are basically digital serfs. Yeah. Um, I mean, serfs, right? Our, our digital self, uh, selves don't belong to us. And how do we prevent such a thing in, yep. in the realm of data, right? In, of healthcare data, because I think that that, you know, it's dangerous. If we're not careful, then all of that belongs to a corporation, right? It's, are yeah. you aware of, you know, companies like yourself, like your own company or others working on, on those kinds of uh, solutions? So, um, yeah, so I, I, I think that genie is like out of the bottle. Um, we're not gonna be able to, you know, Put, we're going to be able to go back in another direction. It's like uh, and the, another analogies I like is the, the dinosaurs in like Jurassic Park. And one of the key lessons of Jurassic Park is like as much as you think you can contain nature, you can't. Um, you know, that's a fiction book. But as much as you think you can contain data, you can't. Um, and it's out there. And um, yeah, it, you, you can decide to turn off TikTok, but people are going to use some other social media thing. I mean, uh, I guess you would have to prove that by looking at multiple universes, but that's my hypothesis and I'm going with it. So I, I think you're asking what is the really important question if we acknowledge that we are, we're gonna have this data out there and what you, I think, very correctly brought up is that it's largely beneficial, right? Um, okay, maybe, maybe the largest propaganda machines that the human species has ever seen might not always be beneficial, but at least from a healthcare perspective, sharing this data or having um, having the ability to find other patients who are similar to, to me and make better decisions based on what we've learned from their care, that's beneficial to me. And I think most people would, um, other things being equal, which I get to say, yes, I'm delighted to contribute my data to that pool so that everybody benefits from it. And that you don't have to take my word for. I have a very good scientific data point for, which is clinical trials, right? Yes, people who go into clinical trials get access to something that is a new therapy that's not available elsewhere. And in 
probably almost every case, um, they, they have hope that that's gonna be a better care, care pathway for them than what they would get otherwise. But if you interview them, if you speak to them, almost all of them also have an element of altruism where they realize that they're helping the rest of the world benefit from the fact that they're getting this care early. So all that is great. I think we, we really do need to think societally about the right protections and the right kind of chain of custody for this information. So from a protection perspective, again, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in certain swim lanes. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, a legislative expert. Um, we have a lot of problems with, um, with discrimination in our society and the ones around data and who has what gene or doesn't or who has what HbA1c and doesn't, I don't think is going to be any different. Um, I actually have a thing in the book. Uh, this is not a great analogy, but I'll, I'll bring it up anyway. It's like, why do, we, why do we have medical schools that are based on organs? Like, because when you cut open somebody's body, they all have different colors and textures. Like they're like the bits that you can identify separately. We're actually in a modern medical way. We probably should have people who are graduating from medical school with certain pathways as their specialty because those pathways are reused in almost every organ all over the body. And if you're an expert in that pathway and know how to control it, you can control a lot of different diseases. I'm not suggesting that the cardiologist goes away, um, but you know, maybe there's also P53 ologists, right? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you think about um, kind of our, our frames of mind and how quickly we, we go towards this, this is this thing or this person is this kind of person based on color, shape, context, including biology, like that's something we need to deal with. We need to deal with that culturally. We need to deal with that from a legislative perspective. Yeah, we're not going to come up with all the answers to that, but clearly that needs to happen to get the benefit from the data. But the other thing that we can do, and this is where I think technologists, um, certainly some of the people I have the privilege of working with, can, can have a lever on this situation is around that chain of custody. How do we make sure that, the, that you really own your data? And, it's, and yeah, maybe you're dependent on Instagram to get it to your followers or to communicate with the people who you like to communicate through that service. But again, if that service goes away, there'll be another one. As long as it's your data, as long as it's not that company that has some kind of um, privilege around what you've given them access to. Uh, I am a huge Apple fan. I will be perfectly you know, open about that. I like ever since like Steve Wozniak and, you know, and the Apple two days. Um, but I actually think this, this strategy that they have is the right one of put all the medical data on the patient's phone. Then we all walk around. I think that's what they're doing with health kit and care kit. Like, I don't know anything again, other people don't, but then we're all walking around with our data and we get to choose whose data integrations and whose algorithms we want to have act on it, which, which pools we want to put our data into. And if we become disenfranchised with the pool or we realize that that pool isn't doing things in the ethical or scientific way we want, we can go to a different one. And so I, I do think that that's something we can do to, to encourage people to behave well and to create an environment where they probably have to behave better. Okay, next up is a dear friend of 27 years, Kelly Close. Kelly, are you there? Oh, sorry. Um, I guess I'm registered as Kelly Close. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Petrov. I'm actually working at Close Concerns. I'm here Good. representing Kelly today. All um, right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I was like, am I Kelly? Um, so my question isn't necessarily directly related to data, but um, just sort of going back to your thoughts on the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we've sort of been seeing with vaccine development is that there are certain countries that are sort of almost mm -hmm. toying with the idea of vaccine nationalism. For example, we're seeing Russia, China, and even the U.S. statements coming out by these political leaders being like, oh, we're going to inoculate our country first. Yeah. Um, you know, in an increasingly globalized society, it doesn't really make sense to me that, you know, we inoculate all citizens of one country and not the other because I believe that, like, while there's an outbreak, you know, no one's going to be safe unless we're all, you know, whatever. But um, I guess my question is, like, what do you think the sociological or the political challenge of this pandemic is? And, like, how do we address that? And how do we make sure that there's a coordinated globalized response? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
That, that, that is a really uh, difficult question. I, I, there's another spoiler. I'm not gonna have a great answer for you that solves all that. Um, I, I, I will tell you 100% I agree. Um, I, you know, I, I think that there, there are ethical and scientific and they're both gonna coincide, at least in my mind, um, things that we should be thinking about in terms of vaccine strategies and protecting people who are the, the most susceptible and doing it in a way that's gonna create the most societal benefit, which I think of very much in a global sense. And I think um, virtually any kind of nationalism is, um, it, it is terrifying and usually dangerous. Um, once again, I feel like I have some scientific data points of all of human history. Um, so, so hopefully we, we start to think better. I, it, it is really unfortunate, um, I have to say, that uh, this, is le this hasn't become like a unifying thing um, for the world and, and people are, are kind of taking national or whatever istic views they have of it. Um, if I can, if I can, again, I'm not helping you with the real answer, but if I can lighten things up a little bit, I'll tell you what I, what I would have loved to seen um, and I hope in my lifetime I see it. Maybe it'll be when we discover real evidence for life outside of planet Earth. But like there's gonna be something that happens. I hope that like people realize that like humans are a thing and we're all the same thing. And um, we like to put these borders between us, but we are a giant colony organism that lives on this little rock. And I, I have the privilege of knowing a couple of people who have been, um, who are astronauts. And it seems like everybody who like goes into orbit looks at the planet and is like, oh, I have this whole new view about like how little borders make sense and how I think about human life and existence. And I, it would be great if something happened that got us to all wake up and do that. In the meantime, I think people who feel that way just need to be vocal about it and try to educate people. But yeah, uh, you're right. It's not productive. Um, I am gonna ask a question um, for Jess Vinder, um, who says, great book. Thank you for your insights. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the industry towards integrating genomic data with clinical data yeah. in trials today? And how far away are we from using real-time genomic measurements or data points within um, studies? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I, think that, um, I think that there's a really interesting thing that's happening, and I think interesting in this case in a good way, which is if you take the way we used to as, as the, when we say industry, I'm assuming life sciences industry. Right? Yeah. We think about, or even just healthcare, when we think about precision medicine, right? So give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. That means that given a particular treatment and a particular moment, because it's the right one and we're, we keep narrowing down who the right patient is, um, it means that there are fewer and fewer people who should get that treatment, right? With right patient, right treatment, right time, the, the numbers of patients go down. It's like a mathematical certainty. Also, every time we say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna refine the equation, if you'll allow me, of the right um, treatment for the right patient at the right time, well, presumably there were certain variables that we measured to determine that. So every time we get better at precision medicine, we have to measure more things. And very much apropos to, to what you um, brought up from a genetic data perspective, these are not simple numbers sometimes like, you know, systolic blood pressure. It's not like an integer, right? This might be something which is a, a, a set of variants across a huge number of genes um, and maybe not even just what, what genes people have, but what the expression is, what genes are on or off and looking at their, pro, their proteomics. I mean, there's so many levels of biological complexity and genes are complicated enough. So how are we gonna deal with, not just the fact that there are fewer patients for any given treatment, and we have to measure more data, and that data is getting hugely more complex. The answer is we have to think about evidence in different ways than we thought about it before. And um, this is something actually we've been thinking about at, at, at Medidata a lot. And I think the, the book's not a book about Medidata. Um, you know, Glenn is different than Medidata, but obviously some um, cause I've been, I'm a founder and I've been working there for 21 years. Like some, some coincidence is actually causal. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think, you know, even when you look at, at this idea of generating evidence for what, what therapies are safe and, and valuable to patients, you have to start thinking in this kind of N of one context. You can't go back to the old equation, which was like a single input. Like, do you have high cholesterol? Yes, no. If yes, take statin. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, 
you have to figure out what's the right thing for Glenn right now. And that means that we have to look at that huge stack of data that we were talking about before. We have to do the hard work, not in Glenn, because it's too late to do this analysis for me. And there's only one of me, you know, unless again, we look at parallel universes, we're not going to be able to do a controlled experiment with just me. So now we have to look across the dimensions of data that we have as potential inputs, which ones we think matter, which ones we see signal in. And I think there's no conceptual reason, even though the math might be slightly different, if I know genetic variation, do I have this version of the gene? Do I have that version of the gene? That's actually the same kind of variable as is your cholesterol high or low? And I know there's continuous variables and, and the, the statisticians on the call will say, yes, it's more complicated than that. But even those statisticians, I think you can go with me on this. There's, there's inputs. And we figure out which inputs are the ones that have outsized effects on the output decisions. And what we do is we build a data set of people that look like me based on the combination of inputs that we've determined matter in this particular equation. And we make a prediction about given how many, and if, if we don't have a lot of people like me, the prediction is gonna be weak and we know that. And if we have a lot of people like me based on those, those variables, the prediction can be very strong and we know that. And we can, my, my doctor and I can factor that into the decision, but I think that's the context that we need to use when we think about practicing medicine differently with all these, these different things. And it's one of the things that I, in the book, it's about how doctors need to think about it, how patients need to think about it, how incentive systems have to start to, to reward and, and discount based on, on that certainty that we were talking about. And it's a mm -hmm. big paradigm shift, but I think it, it will have outside rewards because we'll all get better therapies. And you know, at the end of the day, I, I try to make the point that, you don't have to sacrifice looking at the population for looking at the individual if you do it with the right kind of math and, and right. you're asking the right stuff. Okay, next up is James Sheridan. James? Hi, Glenn. This is uh, James Sheridan. I'm from Columbia School of Public Health. Um, I'm also a fellow Carnegie Mellon alumnus. Too. Yes, go, go Tartans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not many of us out there, but it's always nice to uh, see a fellow Tartan. By the way, it's a like, huge no, school. How, however many attendees there are, there's, there's, there's like there's like fifty something people going Tartans. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Our mascot is cloth. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> we look good in flannel. Um, so I wanted to pick up working at a school of public health. I wanted to pick up your uh, your note on health disparities, mm -hmm. and just wanted to know. Um, as you uh, at metadata, you know, we have just such a massive amount of information about disparities, yep. both in New York City across the globe. How can metadata's platform work with public health professionals to sort of quantify this and, and learn from these COVID-19 outcomes disparities? Yeah, so, so I have to caveat my answer with, it's, it's not actually metadata's data to, to um, do stuff with. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I think the as I would think about the question is how can Medidata's platform, or let's not make it Medidata centric, how can any healthcare platform, but I will talk specifically about ours in a sec, um, help private industry interact with public health in a more productive way? And the reason I say it's not our data is because the data actually belongs to the pharmaceutical companies who are running those research projects and to the patients who contributed their data. So with the caveat, not caveat, but the added layer from the question before that I just, I don't understand how it's possible that somebody can volunteer to be in a medical experiment and not get their data back. And we're actually doing stuff to try to fix that. Um, but the next question is, shouldn't that data be used in, in some way, whether it is uh, an issue of, of um, inequality or access or, or what have you, or frankly, just practicing better medicine. I, I think that we, we as technologists need to think of our services as a catalyst, as a, as a, a barrier lowering element, lowering element that can bring industry and the public sector together. I think actually everybody benefits. There's this kind of, I'm gonna hoard all my data because everybody thinks about it like oil, um, but they shouldn't. And if we can start to connect actual like public private partnerships around some of the data sets that companies like Medidata are amassing, it, it's not like that's gonna give away the trade secrets of you know, a pharmaceutical company or a biotech. Um, in fact, they'll probably learn more understanding what the market opportunities are for doing that. So I, I feel like there needs to be a lot more dialogue. Um, I know there are groups that do that. 
Um, but I certainly, you know, we put our money where our mouth is there. We, we, we have patient advocacy groups, we have regulatory groups, and we make sure that we're out there talking to people about how they can partner around looking at that data together. The nice thing is, and this companies like, like us, who frankly have healthy businesses in terms of creating the infrastructure to put that data out there. The, uh, the COVID data set I was just talking about, uh, everybody, every company that's involved, and a bunch of research, uh, academic research institutes like John, Johns Hopkins, I think one of the big ones, everybody's in there, everybody's doing all the work on their own dime and putting in all the money for the infrastructure, you know, out of other profits that they'd otherwise be taking. So I know it's possible, we just need to create more compelling opportunities for it. So Glenn, it is hard to write a book. Do you, any plans for a second one? Do you have, a, do you have another one in you? So, so in, in uh, full disclosure, there was a, a term in my contract with Wiley that said that they wanted rights of first refusal in my second book. And I was like, I haven't even written a first book yet. I'm so tickled pink that that's the case that like, I definitely want to sign the contract with you now. I was like, okay, great. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like a, a patient equation too, or like some science fiction novel. I am a nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have some ideas of crazy science fiction books. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I have to say, I really enjoyed um, uh, writing the book. It was a lot of work. Actually, I have the book with me. Yes. I also, I want to give a huge shout out to this dude, Jeremy Blockman, whose name is on the cover. Yes, it's in a smaller font than my name. Um, but he was an amazing co-author. Um, he's actually an awesome writer. Uh, he's, he's got some uh, uh, good novels out and he's done a bunch of writing with other people. Um, and and uh, he made it super easy because he's such a good writer and he was such a good thought partner. And, and I just had a blast working with him. So um, if anybody's thinking about writing a book and you need to like interview a bunch of people and you want to have somebody who's like a journalist with you, find a really good writer to work with. And if you want to know what to do when you get a stack of edits from your publisher and you don't have to figure out how to deal with that the first time, find another writer to work with, but we'll see about the next book. How long did it take you? So it was, it was, I, I, somebody asked me this the other day. I couldn't remember the exact day we started. We had like a year almost when we had written an outline and some sample chapters and we had a, um, a, a book agent who I just think was a terrible book agent. Like I, <laughs> I, I'm being fully disclosive. I was like, is it possible that nobody wants to read my book? <laughs> I was like, how could that be? No, um, it's not. It's right? not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny. But in, fact, in fact, it does seem not possible because as soon as I like started to realize, I don't think this book agent is actually doing their job and replaced them with somebody else in like two weeks with a couple of publishing companies who want to publish a book. Um, so that, that put this like giant hole in the middle. I think of actual writing and actual work on the book, it was probably like a year and a half, but there was like a chunk in the middle. Before we go, um, I wanna talk a little, just about Medidata and, and how you've really shaped New York City healthcare. You really have. Um, the credit, but okay. No, you have. You were one of the earliest um, companies. So here we are in 2020 and New York City really is a digital health epicenter. What's your feeling about that? And where do you see it in going in the future? So, so um, I think it came up before, like I am a born and bred New Yorker. I love New York. Um, Bunny and I were talking uh, before we, it, and Bunny and I are friends, but like we were talking before this started about the fact that like, you know, bad stuff has happened in New York before. It's going to happen again. I think pretty much every decade of my now almost five decade life, some point, at least once, sometimes twice in that decade, people have been like, well, New York is over and it's been wrong every time. So, you know, I, I, I think New York is like the center of the human universe in, in a lot of different dimensions. And even though it didn't make sense when we started Medidata to have a company focused on life sciences and software here, um, I'm super happy that it now makes more sense. And I think all the things that made it a great place for us to do it then have just gotten better. We have, um, by the way, Bunny Ellerin has written a book about how New York is an amazing oh, company. Yeah. And she has her book too. 
<laughs> which is like 35 years old. So but still true, still true, right? So you have, true, right? you have amazing academic institutions. You have a gigantic, super diverse population that not that we don't have our own problems we need to fix in New York, but everybody can get to almost any doctor on the subway. Like it's, we're close. We have amazing infrastructure and we have a huge number of industries that sit on top of each other. Like most of the people who we got to be in tech, whenever it's like, well, you can't have a tech company unless you're on the West Coast. Well, yeah, except for every financial institution whose tech runs circles around every Silicon Valley company's tech because it actually runs the fucking planet instead of being like for people's pleasure. And we got a ton of people from banking to who were doing, you know, 24 hour systems that needed to work in real time to be some of our first engineers. That's the kind of dynamism that I think makes New York a great place for um, industry innovation, for entrepreneurship. Um, and I just, I, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm in New York with this chip on his shoulder. I know it, I just don't think that's gonna go away. Well, Glenn, this has been an incredibly entertaining fun, and uh, instructive educational uh, hour. Uh, as I said before, the book really is terrific. It's so well done. I mean, you you read through it. Like I said earlier, you feel like you're you're there. It's very conversational. You feel like you know the patients that you talk about. There's a lot of really good stories. Um, there are concepts like that you know that I ref I had to get refreshed in my head. Um, so anyhow, I really appreciate that you took the time to speak to the audience and answer all the questions and highly encourage people to purchase the book. Uh, we will be doing the raffle later. So we cool. will, and it will be totally legitimate. Totally legitimate. Okay. Of course. Totally legitimate. Um, so thanks again. Thanks again, Glenn. If anybody has uh, questions and we didn't get to them, um, at Captain Clinical on social. And uh, I love the NYCHPL. Thanks for having me, Bonnie. Absolutely. And yes, Glenn is so at Captain Clinical on um, very entertaining. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.